why. And so this table, whether Mary knew it or not, correlates really well with how we moved into agriculture. Now, one other thing that I didn't expect I was going to start with was the historical aspects. But why not? We're at the Borlaug farm, and, and when I read the book, um, you know, Our Daily Bread, and it was the first time I really knew, coming from Canada and coming from a, a pure plant physiology background, um, I hadn't really known much about Norman Borlaug except that he was the first agricultural scientist to win a Nobel Prize. Um, so reading that book was so enlightening for me because it was a history of agriculture and it really took us through right from the beginning because it was born early in the 1900s. And when you start thinking about, oh, well, there were horses and then they were fine, and then, oh, the tractor came, oh, now we don't have to feed half of our farm to animals, we can actually farm the whole farm, and now oh, we, we can make money, oh, then we're really making money and we actually have some money now and we're not poor farmers. And then when he talks about how when he first saw fertilizer and how important that was to him and, and how that changed his life. But you know what it also did is we haven't changed that much because he's trying to convince people how important fertilizer was and what it could do. And we are, and he, he hit that brick wall where everybody's like, oh yeah, sure works really well, and we're not going to change. Um, and, any of that resonate with any of you? <laughs> that whole change thing? <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, one of the things when we think about that is, I'm going to take you right back to that time. So I can't speak a lot about the United States, because again, I grew up in Canada, but um, in 1901, Canada started its first agricultural research center on the northern Great Plains. And when I say northern Great Plains, I am talking about central Alberta. Um, and there wasn't really Great Plains because at that time, um, it was parkland soil, so we had trees on it. And when, there, when we say glaciation, I mean, we, that really did happen for us. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but then in uh, 19, well actually, that was 1900, in 1901 they started the Lethbridge Research Center, which is the northern part of the northern Great Plains, which was prairie. Um, and it was a cool grass prairie. And um, so, we'll give you that, that's when we started agricultural science in Canada. Um, and uh, then they did this in 1910, they did this experiment on what happened to organic matter when you plowed. Uh, and when you plowed, the first time you plowed the soil, you lost 32% of the organic matter. Gone. And then the really good news is, is that every year after that, you only lost 16%. Uh, and then after you've done it for a really long time, you only lost 3%. Uh, and then it kind of stabilized that 3% for the rest of the time. So a lot of you, I heard the whoa about 11 and 12 percent organic matter. That is standard, classic prairie soil, not just warm season soil. We see it at Kansas and Kansas, all of that. But you know what was really interesting is that was in the soil. Because when we had the bison come through and things like that, they just tromped it in, they grazed it off, and we actually put that material into the ground and we got rid of the thatch layer and things moved on. The other thing was, is, and it also built up all those forbs that really drive nutrient, like nutrient change and nutrient cycling. And so one of the things that, and then the other thing we learned from there, and this has to do with wheat. So we're going to pass on corn beans for just a moment. We're going to talk about wheat because here we are on the Borlaug farm, and this is about wheat. Um, was that um, with the wheat, we, we learned in the 1920s that when we put a mixed forage crop in our rotation, we had a 10% increase in wheat yields and protein with a mixed, with a mixed forage crop. Okay, that was 1910, okay, 1910. No, that was 1920s. Um, and now we fast forward here and we're talking about cover crops. We are not talking about anything new, folks. This is really old stuff. Um, it's just that they didn't have fertilizer then, and so they were looking for ways to rebuild the, the soils and to keep the organic matter up so that you could feed the soil to feed your plants, 
to feed yourself and your pocketbook. So they were working it from the foundation of soils and feed your soils, feed your plants. And, and organic farmers, and I, and I know that there is somebody who's transitioning to organics today in, here, in this room, um, that's what, and that's what we can learn back from there and then take it forward is that these cover crops are about feeding your soil so the so soil can feed your plants and, and you can actually grow some of your own nitrogen. And you all go, well, why would that be really important? Well, I was just in Denmark. Three weeks ago, I was in Denmark. The Danish government, the scientists, their NGOs, their non-government organizations, and their green groups are pushing for Denmark to become a completely organic country. There are a lot of very upset farmers. Because we all know how much farmers like to be told what to do. Um, and they're very upset. Um, so much so that they formed their, all these farmers got together and and how many of you think about that? They formed their own organization to start lobbying the government, but not with lobbyists themselves. They decided that, okay, if they're going to try and push this on us, we are going to push back, and it's time that we actually got together and said something about what's going on. But now they're behind the eight ball, because everybody else has got to step up on them. Last year, two years ago, they lost, 20, they lost their right to use half the nitrogen. They actually got nitrogen limits on what they could use in all their crops. And they could only buy X amount of nitrogen per acre. Now, they couldn't even make protein on their wheat. These people are growing, I mean, all the crops I saw over there are 200, 250 bushel wheat. Um, and imagine if they were not as far north how much corn they could grow. And maybe with climate change they will. Um, but one thing I would say about that is that they couldn't make protein. So they took it upon themselves, and this is their first lobbying effort. They said, well, what does that cost our economy of Denmark if we lose 30% of our protein? And they put numbers to that. And they got 20% of the fertilizer back by showing that not only did it affect their hogs, because it did, it affected their export, it meant that they had to import more. I mean, it had, it had a huge effect on their economy because it, what most people don't realize is that still most of Denmark is agriculturally based. So, you're close to the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. We all know what that means. I don't need to spell that out. Um, so, Learning to grow some of your own nitrogen, showing that it's in organic matter is not a bad thing. Because that's one thing I said to all of them was, you know what, you guys are going to have rice. We know that they've already had them. They only got 20% of what they lost back. Um, so that means they're still 30% short on what they need, probably. So now it's about how do we grow that back. That is a big learning curve, and it's a forced learning curve, and no transition time, no, like, let's gear up. Um, really, in some ways, the NRCS is doing you some favors by their saying soil health is important. We need to gear up. Uh, don't ignore that message, because it is coming. Uh, phosphorus limits. Um, I work for the California blueberry growers. California, California has nitrogen rigs, and they are going to get tougher. Um, and you've got urban, co you've got urban cousin cousins all over here that don't understand that you're not poisoning their land and their drinking water and all that, that you're doing a really good job. It's time to, and we're all here today, I know there's some people who maybe aren't on farms today, we just need to work all together and tell the story of food, which is what Norman Borlaug was doing. Uh, he was telling the story of food in the poorest countries, and unfortunately, that message didn't really get here because we have abundance. And most of us should be privileged not to know starving. We didn't grow up in an era where we starved. Um, I have the fortune, or misfortune, however people want to see it, but I think the fortune of being in, working and living in the poorest countries in the world, where you see billboards of showing the same change in the height of your children when you have nutrition, when you have food. 
So sometimes traveling teaches us, like it did Norman, about the, uh, the value of where we live and to really embrace where we live and know that there's no stepping back from that and there's only going forward and building it even better. So um, that's my little soapbox speech for today. But we are going to get into soil health. But I thought this graph was really, really important in telling us about where our native prairies were and how balanced they were and how we are so out of balance right now, we need to get back in. Now, the one thing I will tell you, looking at all these beautiful fields of corn and soybeans, <laughs> is that corn and soybeans love each other. They actually do. The mycorrhizae that grow on soybeans, corn loves it. And the mycorrhizae that grow on corn, soybeans love it. And we're going to talk about what mycorrhizae are. Um, and, and, you're bal and, and if we can grow some of this together, we'll be even more balanced because broad leaves and legumes in the rotation actually help our cereals. And cereals with broad leaves and legumes help them too. And then we start to see something that's really cool, which is called out-yielding, and where things that grow together out-yield each other. So, for example, when I grow chickpeas separately from flax, um, you know, uh, a good flax crop might be 30 bushels, 40 bushels, somewhere in there. I don't know. What, what are yours, Rick? Right in there. Right in there. Um, and then when we grow chickpeas, well, that's a little different story. Um, I can be 70 to 100 pounds, uh, 70 to 100 bushels sometimes. Um, but when I put flax and chickpeas together like Derek Axton does in Saskatchewan, woo, 50 bushel flax, 100 bushel easy on the chickpeas, and they're all grown together, one row beside the other row, all harvested together, all out yielding each other, and whoa. And if you think about the markets for flax and chickpeas, uh, that's a, and the fact that, well, when you grow things like that together, all you can use is a grass herbicide, can't really do much else. Um, and in fact, the cool thing about it is that you don't actually have to use much of anything, and the chickpeas actually feed the flax, and the flax kind of feeds themselves. And oh my, my cost of production just tanked, and that meant more money to me. Yes? Our quality on our chickpeas by doing that goes up tremendously. We make better grade. Okay. So, now you hear it from the farmer, and not just me. I farm a very small piece because mine's an experimental farm. Yes? Is it very easy to clean and that, separate them? Oh, yes. Flax is very, very small seed, and the chickpeas are nine over them. Yeah, the chickpeas are like the top of your thumb when you grow the gooeys and then the the flax just falls through i mean yeah you all you have to do is sip out the chickpeas and everything else falls out of the way both of them thrash extremely easily in the heart yeah. it's, it's a no-brainer so and you're you're a little on the humid side for chickpeas i'll tell you that because <laughs> uh they there's some fungal diseases in there that just really humidity is like yeah i love to grow on leaves um but you've already experienced that with some of your soybeans. So that's just the start of it. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to plug in. And I have my technical director here, which I'm thrilled for. <laughs> yeah, actually, the USB is on the other side there. It'll make it easier. Yeah. Um, and we're all plugged in. And it's just going to search it for a minute. So I didn't finish my story about historically speaking. So, in 1898, in Urbana, Illinois, they showed that intercropping clovers with corn increased the quality and the protein in corn and actually enhanced your yield by 18%. Wow. At what kind of rate on the clover? Well, <laughs> yeah, they don't talk a whole lot about that because that was at a time when nobody actually had to write a whole bunch except just observations, right? Because <laughs> uh, that, was, that was reported on in 1900. And, and actually, I kind of like their scientific writing because it was very um, almost biblical in some ways. Um, but, I, you know, it was really, uh, it was really fun. Uh, okay, so we're going to just stop that. We're going to go here. And... Um, there we go, slide from. I'm going to start from the beginning. Okay, so we are now officially going to go down the wormhole. Um, 
And I, I have to start by saying this. My, my son just graduated from UND on August the 5th, so last a week ago today, uh, yesterday. And um, I'm not in, well, in science, but actually in aviation. I guess his mother um, started out by traveling a lot. And, so we have some similarities there um, with Norma Barlock, a um, mother that wasn't at home as often as she'd always liked to be, but was home when he was really young. Um, and, uh, and so he graduated in aviation technology management. Um, he is a commercial pilot, single engine, multi-engine with all the various requirements. Part of that was, as he said, Mom, you know, get wealthy so we can have an airplane and I'll fly you around. <laughs> okay, well, son, get wealthy and maybe you can fly me around. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he gave me this because he told me that people didn't know what I was really like. <laughs> and he wanted to make sure that people in the audience had some idea of what his mother was really like. Um, and I think this also came because he, I told him that he wasn't allowed to use a picture of Miss Frizzle. Um, and I, I was really out of it when I did that. Um, okay, uh, I thought we needed to start with a picture of wheat because I thought that was really important. So this is in the Pacific Northwest, and some of you last year met Fred Fleming. Um, this actually, uh, his farm is in the background there. Um, this is uh, 80 bushel wheat, hard red wheat, DNS actually, dark northern spring wheat, um, and it was 15% protein, uh, but we had such a good year that we, uh, well, we no, there was no bonuses paid on that, but at least I didn't get docked, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, and so, uh, th so I just thought people should see wheat and see where I live. Okay, so one of the things is, um, I think the important thing is, because we hear about sedimenting here, and the one thing that I don't think they say about water quality very much is that sediment, it's not so much just about the nutrients, it's about the nutrients in the sediment that cause the biggest problems, and we learned that in the Great Lakes. So a lot of the research in the Great Lakes shows very clearly that it's not just nutrients flowing in the water, it actually has a lot to do with the sediments and sedimenting things, um, which is more important than anything else. So we don't want to lose any at soil. Now the other thing about that is, is that, you know, it's really only the top six inches of your soil. Now, you're blessed in Iowa with deep, beautiful soils. Um, our soils really are, in many places, six inches. And I can tell you that parts of Oregon, they're only four. What that means is that agriculture as a whole cannot overrule ecosystem services. We have to work together with them. I'll give you an example. I was at the Missouri Corn Growers. And um, they're having a problem right now because they, with um, energy generation, and they need water for pumping and all of that kind of thing, um, for a lot of their pivots, um, there's a bunch of mercury put into the air through some of that. And they're saying, well, we just need the water. Who cares about the mercury? Uh, no, we, we, we can't. And, and, you know, and I wasn't very popular after that. I said, look, guys. No, that's not how it works. I know you need cheap energy to do some of this because your margins are really small, but putting mercury into the air is not a good thing. Um, and you breathing it and anybody else breathing it and, and the people in the city, and you keep having that attitude that agriculture rules and everybody else has to put up with it, um, you're going to lose because there's a lot more of them than there are you. Um, and they have the ear of the governments more than you do, um, even though you have your senator here today. Um, and he just kind of went like this, <laughs> like, yeah, I got a lot more of them constituents than I do of you. Uh, so the point is, is that, that, so that point there is really about we as farmers cannot ignore um, nitrates in the water um, and things that are happening in Mississippi. Now, we may not do them, and maybe it's somebody else, but it, some other farmer somewhere else, but it doesn't matter. We all have to take responsibility and, and work together. And I think the biggest thing about that is, and where I've seen that, is in, um, in uh, Prince Edward Island, Canada, and then again in Australia on the west coast where they do a lot of oyster, they grow a lot of oysters for the market. Everything that goes on upstream affects them totally and their ability to make money. And so they 
embrace the farmers upstream and said, hey, can we all get together because what you guys do really screws me up. And I need you to help me. And then it was like, well, why should we help you? Well, you should help me because this is about water quality and all these other things, and maybe if we all work together, we can all, you know, do a watershed project and all be better off. And they did. And it took those potato farmers to actually realize that what an effect they were having on him and how much money he was losing and how much money he could make and how much he could funnel back into the community if we could just all work together. So that's that, that is really about let's work together. And I all say that in a different way, but thanks for pointing that out. All right. <laughs> so some of you still do tillage. Ever notice how this tidal wave actually looks a whole lot like a moldboard plow? <laughs> has that look to it, right? Um, that's what's happening in the soil when you use a moldboard plow. Think about the destruction that you are doing to the below ground infrastructure. And then think about the amount of energy it would take to rebuild. The amount of organism energy, the amount of actual energy that would be required. So put yourself in that situation this is above ground. Think about rebuilding all those buildings. Think about rebuilding all those roads. Think about all the people that need to be involved and all the expertise you need and all the services that you need in order to do that. Well, when you put a moldboard plow through your field or any kind of a tillage implement through your field, everything in the soil is having to redo things. And we wonder why sometimes our soils don't work very well. Well, it takes a lot of energy. So, if we are recovering from this, which some of you are, and some of you are embracing no-till, or minimum tillage, or strip till, or whatever you want to call it, um, then you are actually, the other thing you have to bear in mind is that when you change and you transition, you are, your soil is using a lot of energy, and is rebuilding a lot of populations, and is rebuilding a lot of structure, and a lot of infrastructure, in order to recover. So sometimes we think, oh well, no-till and strip till, that means fewer inputs. No, no, it does not. It actually does not. When you make the transition, it means more. Because now, ever noticed how pregnant women eat a lot more food and different kinds of food? Your soil is now really pregnant. Your farm is pregnant. Because your soil is now growing, developing, building a whole new population, building all this new infrastructure. It needs a lot of energy, and it needs coming, and the only way it gets energy is from plants. How long is that going to take? <laughs> ah, well, we we're going to talk about that at lunch, but we're going to, it, it actually, depending on what your rotation is, depending if you have cover crops, depending if we can put companions in, we can take three to five years to really rebuild. I hate to say depends because everybody says, oh, those scientists, it's always the same. It depends. But not back to the prairie. Not back to the prairie. I'm not talking about back to prairie. To get back to prairie, we have to go back to having a perennial system in our rotation in order to do that. And I doubt that there are very many of us that are going to do that again. But that doesn't mean that we can't have diversity and we can't rebuild to a certain extent. Maybe it's not going to be the same, but actually we are never going to support the productivity that we have today on prairie if we have the prairies, like the prairie levels of soils. I mean, we just can't do it. How about the perennial crops that the Land Institute is working on? Perennial crops of the land, they still don't yield the way we yield. I mean, they yield a fraction, probably about a quarter of what we have now. On they a keep, keep the soil and regrow. They keep the soil, but I, I would, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I mean, I like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I like the idea of it, and mm -hmm. I think it's for some people, and it's not for others. Okay. Um, I think that um, I can do a lot of that with companion cropping. So I can have an annual cash crop and I can put companions in that give me diversity and actually give me some other things um, and give me some value with insects and, but, and, and herbicide and fungal control that I was going to have to do in a perennial system too because even if I grow perennial wheat, I still have to have the diversity in there. I'm going to have diseases and I'm going to have other things too. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's the perfect answer. You still have to have the diversity. Mm -hmm. So. Where, where is that place in the slide? Oh, actually, this is um, 
Isn't that a good? Uh, actually, somebody made this. <laughs> <laughs> it is fake. Um, they combine things together. This is a coast in India, and uh, actually, this is a picture of the tsunami from Thailand. And they just and and um, and they put it together um, just to give people an idea of the damage that a tsunami could actually do in a populated area. Um, you know, when you talk about that, it's going to take an increase of energy on that transition. Mm -hmm. You're speaking of mostly nitrogen. Okay. When I say it's going to take energy on that transition, it's not just nitrogen. It's trace elements. It's um, uh, if you're making the transition to no-till. Nitrogen is a big part of it, but it's also um, balancing all your nutrients at the same time. And it, it's going to take an increase in organic matter, and that's one of the things we have to really think about is that when we make the transition, we also have to feed our below ground, and, and our below ground organisms are not just nitrogen, they're being fed by root exudates from the plants. So that's like keeping a green plant on the ground as long as we can. That's what the important thing is. So, what characterizes a healthy soil? Good soil structure. Why? Because, it because that's the infrastructure. That's how everything works. So if we have a good soil structure, we already know that we are making progress, that we are seeing our soil work for us. Um, now, and it's not just, you know, just, and we're going to see that because we're going to demonstrate that. Shape, size, data, and, dem you know, distribution and arrangement of soil pores is really important. Large, large pore spaces actually allow us to have reactions and have infiltration, aeration, and all of those things. And like I said, any great city, if the city is going to keep growing, going to keep being vibrant, then we have to keep having those services happening, which means that we actually have to think about the plants that we put in. Okay, this is what it looks like. Now, does that not look like infrastructure, like a map? <laughs> and that's a soil cross-section. And all the, all the uh, amoebas and all these other things are moving around in here because they can't dig, they can't make tunnels, so they're all moving around in here, and they're having access to the bacteria and the fungi, and they're eating them up, and they're pooping them out, and then they're creating more biological activity, and they're feeding themselves. But the better thing is, is that that means they concentrate nitrogen in all their little poops. But look at how they aerate the soil. Look at when they're pooping it out and they're putting in aggregates. Look at how loose it is and how much air is in around it. That's why everything likes being in that. It loosens it up. And you can see all the space around the particles because of biological activity. It's making infrastructure. And mycorrhizal fungi, this is a root. And you can see, look like umbilical cords to the root. This is the mycorrhizal fungus itself. And mycorrhizae can't live without a host. They can only live by them. They can't live by themselves. They have to have a host plant. And when they have a host plant, they're doing this. They're gluing the soil particles together. They're allowing the plant to have access to them. They're keeping all the aggregates nice and wet because that means there's air and water moving next to the root. The photosynthesis from the plant is feeding them so that they can grow more hyphae, so they can explore more areas, so they can feed the plant more. The little ones are the hypha? The hypha, here, yeah. And you even get to see a spore forming on the edge of it. So, soil is a habitat. If you build it, they will come. And I'm in <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> so you build it, they will come. So let's build a habitat and they're going to come. Um, okay, I know there's some John Deere people in the crowd. I'm not advertising for John Deere, but this is our, um, the rig. Uh, and um, we're all having a good look at it because that was the new drill when we first got it, and we're all checking it out and seeing if we like it. Um, that was really, um, we started looking at drills. Um, I can't tell, I think that technology has a really important part to play in all this. And as we get into cover crops, and we get into growing companion crops and interseeding and things like that, um, we are going to be pushing our manufacturers really hard to keep up with us on what we need. We really are. Um, because we're going, like, we're not just going to have the same thing over and over again. Now you've got to make sure that I can 
that I can have cover, that I can put my companions between the row. I have RTK or Raven, whatever you have, that allows you to have GPS. Now I can really do it because now I don't have to rely on me being able to drive a straight line, um, which I'm not very good at. My husband is because he has that laser focus thing that a lot of men do, you know, like just like, um, and women know about that. Um, and, and, you know, I think that, um, I think that the technology is, and I don't mean it just in the iron part of the technology, but there's also genetics and things involved too, and analytical. But this is, I mean, I love this picture. This is from South Africa, but you can see the topsoil coming down. This is the mineral soil coming up, all because of earthworm activity. And I can't, and earthworms are the great soil engineers. And Darwin called them nature's plow. That's what they're doing. They're mixing it for you. And, and a lot of you have night crawlers here. You can actually count the middens, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about what you can do there. So a lot of you might know about Dave Brandt in Ohio, Carroll, Ohio. Well, this is Dave. This is his white planter, his famous white planter that he likes to talk about. Um, and he's seeding into a cover crop grain. Um, and uh, when I was in Arkansas, there were a lot of people that said, oh, there was actually a guy from Ohio even that said, Oh, we can't do that. And I was like, well, um, you mustn't know Dave Brandt because he, he actually does this. And then there were a whole bunch of people in Arkansas that said, yeah, we do that. <laughs> uh, we can all see it into the green stuff. Uh, it's about learning how to do it. So I had one scientist I know, his name is um, Perry Miller, and he's at Montana State University. And he said, you know, I, I needed to have a brain transplant when I started getting into what I'll call the new conventional. Because... I need to put some of the old ways away and stick them in a box and say, I can't go back. I have to take the first step forward. And it's sort of like Indiana Jones. If you like Indiana Jones movies, it's like when he steps off and he got caught. And there was a bridge there and he just had to see the bridge. Um, that's what you're doing when you do some of this new stuff is you're taking that step and you're stepping off. And, you know, it's a hard thing because there isn't a lot of support for you out there when you take that first step. Um, you know, we try and teach everybody, but sometimes you just got to believe that you're doing the right thing and you got to go for it. And, and then, you know, um, you hear all the time when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I think that that actually is true a lot of the time, is that when you're ready and you take that step, you'd be surprised at how many resources you have in your community to help you with that first step. What, what is... Being planted amongst the green corn. Yeah, it's planting corn. And what's the green stuff? The green stuff is a cover crop, so that's mostly rye. You can see a few flowers oh. in there. There's a bit of canola in there. And so he just put it right in there. He just put it right in there, and then he rolls over it and crimps it and chops it all up, so it dies. And then the corn grows up through it, and um, he doesn't fertilize, and he doesn't put herbicide, and he doesn't do much, and and he makes 200 bushel corn. <laughs> wow. And, um, and, <laughs> and his soils, wow. his soils um, actually, I've got to say this right, the Ohio State University has changed um, his soil type on his farm. So they have officially declared it a different soil type from all his neighbors, and that's what he's done in 20 years. How does he get by planting a, a grass behind the grass? I mean, is it just because it's... Well, it's not actually full grass. He actually okay. has a lot of diversity in there that from that okay. photo you really couldn't see. He's okay. got a lot of broad leaves in there, too, because he's usually got peas, and he's usually got radishes, and mm -hmm. he's got a bunch of other stuff in there, too. Um, and if you can't tell... Um, if you and, and people go, oh yeah, that's that that's that darn Blake Vince, um, and he designed, but he didn't. He's the one who decided to use underpants. Um, and the kids tomorrow are going to know about Captain Underpants. This takes Captain Underpants to a whole new level. Um, this uh, this actually, and I got some cotton material outside. Is a real test, by the way. We didn't use co under, cotton underpants before. Um, we actually used to use cotton strips, and you'd buy them in England, and they were manufactured and milled in exactly the same way, and they were cut to the same size, 
and they would sell it to you with a tensiometer. And then after you buried it for the strip for a while, you would pull it out, you would wash it out, let it dry again, and then you would put it on and you would stretch it. And the amount of energy it took to break it apart gave you an idea of how much biological activity you had. And you go, well, what, how does this indicate biological activity? Well, what is cotton? It's fiber. It's fiber. Pure fiber. That's why I have to be 100% pure cotton. I wonder what organic cotton would do. We should have, Warren, we should have a go at that. Might be one tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, and see if there's any difference. But what's important is you're breaking down cellulose, hemicellulose. You're actually breaking it down. What does this indicate? Fungi. It's the first thing. So nothing woody breaks down in a field without fungi. Nothing. No tree in the forest breaks down without fungi. Fungi are the, the things that break down all those woody residues. Corn stalks, corn stalks, corn cobs, all that never break down without fungi. Never. Now, how do fungi get in there? They can't bore holes or anything. Well, they can and can, but actually insects uh, like mites and calembola and that bore holes in the stalks that allow the fungi to come in and then start breaking them out from the inside. So now that we're using and we have BT corns and things like that, that actually, your calembola, by the way, are related to insects, which means that they can't bore holes in those stalks either. That's why corn heads are really important for really chewing up your stalks, breaking them out mechanically, so that things can get in and start breaking them, the fungi can get in and start breaking them down. That is also why we have to watch out for some of the stacks, because we need them to break down, and if they start adding antifungals in there, we will not break down corn stalk. Now, just, I mean, I am not, I'm not trying to be, and I'm not trying to be, you know, somebody who's like, you know, watch out for all this stuff. I just, this is reality, folks, that we need fungi, and even with all our technology, we need those things to burn, to break down. Otherwise, we'll be lighting a match, and I don't want that. Yeah. So would a foliar fungicide do about the same thing as what you're talking about? Um, yeah, to a certain extent it will. Now there's some good news about that too. If we can keep enough residue armoring and umbrellaing the soil, that when we are actually spraying fungicides, then we at least the stuff that's next to the ground is still going to break down and the stuff on top is going to you know, sort of hold it there and then eventually we'll turn it all over. So that's where some of those things are not as bad as actually engineering it into the plant material. Okay, so this is a real test. Um, and if we do enough reps, it's really real. And, and here's the other cool thing about this, is that if we actually wash these up a bit, take the soil off them, we can actually use new technology image analysis to look at the percentage of decomposition and actually make it a real test. So here we are, biology at the top. Chemical and physical properties of the soil are united by the biology. That's why it's at the top. Soil productivity is really um, measured mostly by yield. I want to talk more about food quality. Because if you are a farmer, you're producing food, the quality of your food means that we don't have as much of this. Well, we actually have a lot of this. If we put all the nutrients here, then we don't have the consequences for an environment. We have better environmental quality. And we also have better health for ourselves and for our animals because we're putting all the nutrients here and we're having a very non-leaky system. So the one thing we want to do is we don't want to have a leaky system, we want to have a very closed system so that all our nutrients that we are using are going into our crops. Because we, let's face it, with small margins, especially now with prices, small margins, it means that we have to be very efficient at our nutrients. We can't have, can't afford to have leaking not using every bit of my nitrogen. I need to make sure that works. My phosphorus, all of that, my potash, if I'm using any of that, I need to make sure it's going into my plants and not leaking anywhere. I want to be really efficient. And biodiversity is going to be our ultimate insurance over all of this. It, gives, it means that we are maintaining services. And if we don't have all the services working all the time in our soil, we cannot be really efficient. It's just like if you lose uh, an electrician in your community, it's going to take you a long time to get your lights back on unless you're good for yourself. So the thing is, is that we want to keep all the services because that's going to make a big difference. So, 
Above ground diversity is a fraction of what the below ground diversity really is, but it is a mirror. And the more we add diversity into our systems, the better off we're going to be in the long run. We're going to have more services. And so that's why it's important. Now this, um, all you want to know is that if you look right in here, the very middle of this and then we get to the end, most of these are animals. All your bacteria and fungi are here. They're your primary producers. The bacteria and the fungi can outcompete a plant for nutrients every time. They can produce a whole new generation in 24 hours. So that means that when we're making the transition, we got this, this real machine and pooping them out as nitrogen and nutrients right in and around the roots. So we need to have all those predators. And you'll notice that way on the outside is earthworms. You need to have all this in place, folks, before you get earthworms. So why are earthworms the best indicator of soil health and the easiest one? I, I'm in, I, I, I know that I got a bunch of BT corn around, so um, this is BT. This is the real organism. And this little crystal that you see here is what they engineered into it. And all plants, all plants, remember that plants are stuck in one place. I got my plant hat on now. I'm being a plant. I am stuck in one place. Well, everything that comes at me, I got to be able to defend or I got to be proactive and be ready for it no matter what happens. Right? Because I can't run away. I'm a plant. I can't run away from anything. So I, I either got to kill it if it lands on me, or I got to kill it slowly, or I got to do something. And if something's coming around my roots to graze, well, if I have a bunch of these guys in my, around my roots, they're all going to die. Because all they have to do is take a little bite, and this is named by 10,000 times its size. Well, actually, more than that, it's 100,000. Um, all I have to do is take a small bite of this, and, and within hours I'm going to die. So if I'm a plant, <laughs> I'm sending out signals out of my roots, right? <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> come and live around me. Uh, I want you to protect me from eating, being eaten. Um, I am sending out signals that if an aphid lands on my leaf, I'm sending out a signal, and if it permeates my skin, pokes a little hole in it, I'm sending out gismonic acid, ethylene gas, that tells everybody in the radius around me, armor up. Aphids are here. I'm also telling all the ladybugs and all the predators that, hey, prey's here. You guys better get going. Come on around. Come start eating, because I need you. If a corn rootworm hits my roots and I'm a corn plant, I am sending out signals that say, hey, insect feeding nematodes, parasitizing nematodes, I need you around my roots to start parasitizing these little creeps so that they're stop eating my roots. I'm actually sending out signals like that. Plants produce so many secondary metabolites people don't even understand. We don't even understand. In Missouri, at Columbia, Missouri, um, Dr. Jack Schultz has a very nice video on YouTube that talks about how plants actually defend themselves against diseases and, and insects. And it's, it's a lovely, um, it's a really lovely video. And by the way, Jack Schultz is a brilliant speaker. Um, and he is the only scientist I know that has been featured on the cover of People magazine as a scientist um, <coughs> for his work in entomology. Um, that's on YouTube? Then? And it's on YouTube, Dr. Jack Schultz. And it's about plants communicating with one another. So, fungi, see all this hyphae? Silk strands. It goes in, I already told you, fungi break down everything that's tough and woody, but all their hyphae actually is used like a net, and it starts to really build these beautiful, and I mean beautiful, soil aggregates. And mycorrhizae, this is now mycorrhizae inside the root. So you know I saw like the umbilical cord? Well, this is it inside. And this is where they change over, where photosynthesis, um, the plant feeds the fungus with amino acids and organic acids and some carbohydrates. And this is where the fungus feeds the plant. So that's true carbon trading. 
Mycorrhizae are the original carbon traders. That's what they're doing. They're carbon trading. Um, and they are very, they are not being selfish. I mean, they're not being selfless, they're being very selfish. And I mean that honestly. They're really selfish. What they're doing is saying, I need a host and you need to survive. So I'm going to make sure that you survive. So I'm going to feed you water and I'm going to give you disease resistance and I'm going to give you all these micronutrients to make you strong. And you're going to feed me this photosynthesis. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to increase your photosynthetic capacity because I am actually, uh, I like mega meals. And so I'm going to give you this capability of being really photosynthetic. Oh, but by the way, the other thing I'm going to do is make sure that the microbial community around you is actually beneficial. So there's going to be lots of BT, there's going to be lots of pseudomonas, there's going to be lots of things that protect you from diseases because I need you. But you can see how that works for the plant too. And we need to be able to do, use them, but to use them, we have, we're have we all using too much phosphorus because the plants, when they get too much phosphorus, they, they say, hey, mycorrhiza, I don't really need you. And when we get lots of micronutrients, they say, hey, I don't really need you. And you actually cost me carbon, so I'm not going to use you. So, But we want them to be used. And um, we're going to have a big conference on land races in, um, uh, in November. Um, in Russia, actually. Mm -hmm. I was telling Lauren the story. Um, this is a friend of mine. His name is Bob Quinn. Bob is a farmer in Big Sandy, Montana. He is also the owner of Kamut International and the founder of that company. Um, Bob is also a plant geneticist, a PhD plant geneticist, who said that he, he really regretted that he did a PhD because um, he should have really just gone on to the farm and stayed there. Um, but So then he just went back and stayed there. Um, but he's having it in, at, at an institute in Russia uh, that was preserved um, during the reign of the Nazis because Hitler was going to have his final victory celebration there, so he said, well, no bombing in this place. Um, but the scientists there had the largest collection of land races of things. Uh, largest, and I mean the largest collection of land races in the world. Of our, of our domestic plants, of wheat in particular. And they starved themselves. Two of them died of starvation rather than eat the seeds that they were protecting. And so we think it's very fitting that we have this conference at that facility to honor their um, amazing contribution and sacrifice to the land races that we now have because of their sacrifice. Um, so we're going to do that this year. Um, Bob has 58 races of Turkish wheat on his farm this year, and we are looking at, well, what does this really mean? Are there genes that we've lost? Are there secondary metabolites that we don't have anymore? And how do we put them all back in so that we have better plants? And I think it's perfect to talk about that here in Norman Borlaug's farm, because that's what he would have been doing. What you're saying there, then, in a high phosphorus soil, yeah, the mycorrhizae and what don't work very well. In fact, the plant doesn't invite them to be part of their symbiosis, so they have to wait for another host. The other thing that's really <coughs> cool about this is those land races were all highly mycorrhizal, and a lot of our newer varieties are not. And so that's why we're working on the land races. The other thing that we know is that the plants, when we actually did some of this work and we've been working on it is that the, the, the wheat that is really high, very nutrient dense, tends to be very mycorrhizal, and the ones that are less nutrient dense do not have mycorrhiza as much. So we need to understand what makes that happen. When they're all grown on the same soil without phosphorus and all of that, we see that some plants are just naturally better at taking up micronutrients. Yeah? Uh, GMO, non-GMO, big mycorrhizae difference? There is, actually. Um, not with all varieties. Some stacks, yes, some no. Um, and even with the ancient wheats, like we know that some of them are more mycorrhizal than others. And some of the modern wheats, we know some of them are. We just don't understand really why. Um, uh, but we also know that when we have transgenic plants, so when we're not just breeding, you know, corn and corn and corn, but if we actually are adding like microbial things and insect things into plants, um, we know that plants produce anti-rejection drugs. <coughs> They're called opines. And only those plants produce opines. Other plants don't produce opines. 
-hmm. And we don't really know what opines do in the environment. And that's something that we bothered to really think about very much when we did that. Um, and I'm, I'm not necessarily saying anything against that. I just think that sometimes we need to explore things a little bit more fully. Or, as my friend in South Africa would say, we just don't always watch the whole movie. <laughs> yes. They produce anti-rejection drugs? Yes. So the plants will actually, mm -hmm. what they've done is when they engineered the plants to actually accept mm -hmm. the foreign, you know, protein. foreign, foreign mm -hmm. proteins, the plants mm -hmm. actually produced an anti-rejection drug, just like you would if you had a heart transplant or something, or a transplant, they would have to give you anti-rejection drugs to make sure that you didn't reject your foreign organ, well, they've actually been able to select for plants that actually can produce opines, so they can accept that, and then we just went ahead and bred those. So some don't, some reject it. Yeah, well, no, we couldn't, we couldn't put the genes into every plant that we tried. Some of them actually rejected it and died, yeah. and then it was when you finally got the ones that actually said yes, and we got the techniques that allowed it to happen, then we started breeding them. That's how it worked. How does a farmer out here measure how healthy his mycorrhizal population is. We're going to get to that. Okay. We, but I got the sign that we ought to get going. So, um, yeah, well, well, I'll take yours and then his. So you get I, I just wanted to ask on the phosphorus kick of it, how do we get off of that cycle? You know, we've gotten dependent on phosphorus, but I'm understanding we should probably be trying to use less to benefit our yeah, microbes. We should. And the other thing is that we hear a lot about glyphosate. Actually, if we use less phosphorus in our pl plants, were just slightly phosphorus stressed, the bac and the bacteria were too, they would start breaking down your glyphosate really quickly because it's glyphosate, right? They actually would use the phosphorus in the glyphosate and break it down a lot faster. So you can actually use microbes to your advantage. Um, and that's about actually understanding this whole ecosystem concept and thinking about, well, okay, so here's my system. I got this happening in my system right now. How can I put my system back in balance where it's going to use this? So this is about thinking at a different, like I said, that whole brain transplant thing about saying, oh, I have this system. What can my system do? How can I tweak my system to do things that I need it to do now? Okay, and we had a question back there. Well, to kind of follow up here in Iowa, we have this large areas of uh, swine, so and you got a lot, lot of phosphorus. Of and, uh, so we need a lot of phytate. We need a lot of phy we need to break it down to get to that area. So what we really need to do is take it up into an organic form and then have it breaking down broken down a little bit. And um, one of the things so there are plants that are phosphorus and magnesium and calcium accumulators, and one of the ones that we all know is buckwheat. Buckwheat is an amazing phosphorus accumulator. The other one that is also are lupins. Lupins are also phosphorus accumulators. Um, and, uh, and both of them have acid root exudates that allow them to cleave that off and incorporate it. So one of the ways that we do with, with, with when um, people have used way too much chicken manure or way too much hog manure is actually have a, um, is have a, buckwheat, a, a heavy buckwheat cover crop or, and unfortunately right now, the market for buckwheat um, has actually gone down because the Japanese have known that they now see they have a lot of allergies. So we're not seeing as many people consume, like the export market to Japan right now being as strong. Um, but buckwheat is a, is a great way. So even if we don't grow it for seed, if we can just grow it as a cover crop and have it, um, it's, it's a really good plant for dealing with some of this excess phosphorus and putting it into organic form and then slowing that cycle down a little bit. So where we've got 40 years of no-till or maybe 15 years of cover crop, really good like uh, diversity, would we even have mycorrhizal fungi with all the hunger we have? You might, actually. You still might because of the, because of the, of the cover crops and stuff. It'd be worth looking. Yeah. It really would. Because I think that the diversity kind of compensates for some of that. I think it does. Because we, we see that in some of the places where we've had too much turkey litter or um, too much broiler manure. And we still see some mycorrhiza and we started to see them come back once we started to really bring the diversity in a little bit. And I think maybe the plants kind of protect them from some of the extra. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly how it works. All I know is that sometimes two and two don't equal four. I 
I don't know why, and I don't think any of us know why, but we just know that sometimes when we get it really right, the system works. And we start to work on it. I just want to show you protozoa. I want to show you this because this is a fungus eating a, eating a nematode. Mm -hmm. So when we get it right, you can actually have parasitic nematodes being eaten by fungi. Mm -hmm. um, and fungi really don't like tillage because it disturbs their networks a whole lot. Um, bacteria will survive just about anything. Um, but they're designed to do that, so they can survive pretty much anything you do to them. These guys cannot. These guys need infrastructure in order to work. And who can't afford to be 45% more, percent more efficient with their nitrogen, really? Um, that's what we get from having protozoa. And if you think your soil is not alive, uh, this is 40 years of no-till. This is what it looked like at a handful of soil. Um, it was crawling. And remember that 14 of these fit on the head of a pin, and some of these little guys a lot more. But that's what it looks like. And then if you look at them close up in person, they look like this. This has been the cover on the cover of a lot of magazines. Um, but look at those chompers. That guy is going to go through everything. He's going to eat holes in organic matter. He's going to eat up other things and um, really just, you know, chew, chew the way through things. And this is what they do. These are what the animals do. That's why they're in the middle of all of that, because they're eating all the bacteria and the fungi. They're eating each other. They're recycling. They're your recyclers. Without predators, we don't have recycling. Without predators, I can have long-term no-till soils that are starving plants. Because they got a compaction layer, because it got too wet one year, they went out really early, and they got compaction at the four inch layer, and all the bacteria and the fungi and all those residues were going crazy, starving the plants, pouring more fat. What am I doing? He said, I don't understand. All my plants are starving. I keep putting on more fertilizer, and they're still starving. And then we did phospholipid fatty acids and saw that for every gram of soil, he had one milligram of actual mi microbial biomass and no predators. <coughs> Nothing was eating. It's like having a herd of deer out in your field. <laughs> a big herd. A really big herd eating everything. Um, and, you know, and, and not having predators to recycle. Out of whack. He eats the dead bacteria then. Yeah, they'll eat, they also eat organic matter. So the other thing about these, this is calembola. Mites and calembola really like to eat organic matter that is colonized by fungi. Because they like to eat the fungi, because the fungi have a lot of nutrients in them and micronutrients in them that are concentrated. And so they like to eat organic matter that has been colonized by fungi, so they get extra nutrients. So that's another reason, that whole fungicide thing, that's another reason to actually make sure your soil's armored so that when it's the stuff that's right next to your soil, gets protected from when we're spraying fungicides. Because not only are you killing the fungi, but you're killing all these guys that like to eat the fungi on the organic matter. So we're going to skip by that. Um, some of you might have problems with slugs. Uh, the, when we have cover crops and we have companion crops, we have a lot of habitat and we don't use so many insecticides, we actually get crabbed beetles that love to eat slugs. What kind of beetle? Carabid. So we get predatory beetles that actually love to feast on slugs. So whenever we see something that's really out of, out of, out of sync and really taking over, um, we need to think about our system, our services. We don't have all the services that we need, and we need to think about how do we get our services back. Sometimes that's growing pollinator strips. Sometimes that's growing companion crops. Sometimes it's going um, other crops in there. Um, in potato fields where we have a zero tolerance for aphids, we've actually been surrounding um, the soil, the, the fields with flowers, and then every 500 feet we've been planting a row of flowers in the potatoes to keep up the pollinators um, because they can only fly so far. And the same with the predatory bugs. And then we have a habitat for them. We have insectaries. And so that means we're actually creating refuge in the middle of a potato field so that they can do that. Yeah, Rick? Will that system bring in the crowded beetles then? Yes, it will. Yeah. We actually see them coming in. Yeah. We actually see them coming back. But again, you know, remember predator prey? Predators take a lot longer to come back than your prey. So we think about Danny Forgey when he stopped 
doing a lot more insecticide work because when he saw the effects of the ladybugs on the aphids, um, we actually, you know, then it was like, oh, we actually have the effects of, um, we can actually see the ladybugs and I don't need to spray anymore because if I see a bunch of aphids and I wait two days, they'll be gone because my ladybugs will have eaten them all. And sometimes we need to actually be able to take a breather, know that our ecosystem services are there. Now, Danny knew that it's all the time. It would have nothing on it. We need to add a little bit more carbon to slow things down because otherwise, um, and a little tougher carbon, because we have to make them work and they have to expend a little energy at working at it because if we give it to them in an easy form, then they use up all the nitrogen, they use up all the carbon, and we're done. So if we add enough nitrogen, which is what this means, when this goes down, it means that we got a lot more nitrogen, then they can make more proteins, which means they can make more bodies, which means that they can grow their population faster. If we, if we increase this to 50 to 1, it means they get more carbon, but they don't have quite as much nitrogen in there, which means they have to slow down their population growth. And that's what we're trying to do, because we don't want the, our armor to disappear. How would that vary with perennial crops? With perennial crops, and you saw that with Mary's work, is that perennial crops tend to have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is why they cycle in a closed system. Um, well, yeah, most of them will be 40 to 1, 50 to 1, some 60, 70. Yeah, and they would vary a little bit. Your grasses in there would be like 90 to 100 to 1, but you're, 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 you notice that in a real prairie, you get a lot of forbs, and those forbs actually have a much closer carbon to nitrogen ratio. They'll all be 30, 40, 50 to 1. So we saw that. We've talked about all things that go down on the roots. Diseases are doing this. They're sending out signals that say, slow down, i got to get on. They're lousy competitors. So when we have disease problems, we are promoting lousy competitors, which means our system is not really at its athletic performance Olympic best. We need to get it going. Um, this is root exudates, water and nutrients going in, mycorrhiza, rhizobium, brady rhizobium going in, and if our plants are doing a really good job and they have mycorrhiza and they have rhizobium or brady rhizobium, that means that they're producing plant growth promoting substances, which means that these roots are growing faster because these guys want more habitat, so they want it to, to speed up and branch more, and these guys, the diseases, need it to slow down. The rhizosphere is the root, the soil attached to the root, and the soil influenced by the root because roots leak, mycorrhiza leak. And every different plant you put in the ground leaks its own signature. And it creates its own microbial habitat. And some of them are very exclusive and some of them are very welcoming. And that's where we have to sort it out, like who likes who? And how do we get that out yielding of each other when we grow them together? And how do we get one plant to do something to another plant so that we can use that practice? Um, so, I delved this down to black because I wanted you to just look at the colors. This is nitrogen that plants make. I want four of them better because that means that the ureides, which are the red, the amides, which are the yellow, amino acids, which are the green, and nitrate, which is the blue. I want more of this in molecular form <coughs> with carbon than I do in nitrate form because I'm not going to leak it. This is white clover. This is corn. These are beans and peas. Having beans in our system is a good thing. Adding more beans and peas is a good thing. Having things like sunflowers, not so much nitrate, more amides, some amino acids. This, this is radishes here, almost no nitrate. Right? Because they, they actually absorb it and they change it into amino acids, amides, and amides. They change the form of it, they put it in an organic form that is less leaching. So if we don't want to leak things into the environment, we need to use plants to, to help us with that. We need to use mycorrhizas to help us with that. And you can see corn. Corn is very mycorrhizal naturally. This is a dwarf corn, this is a normal corn. 
Um, both of them have mycorrhiza, but what do you notice about the mycorrhizal plants? This is a little test to see if you're awake, because then we're going to go outside here. So what, what do you notice about them? Observation only. Green. Color. Color, yeah. Remember, mycorrhiza increase photosynthetic capacity of your plants. <coughs> we want that. It means it feeds more of the mycorrhiza. It means that it's more productive as well. The other thing about this green, do you notice that it's also a little bit more blue-green? Not as yellowy green. Uh, that is an indicator that you actually have more vitamins in the, and you also have free amino acids, which if you were a livestock producer, you want <coughs> because that means your plant, your animals don't have to work as hard to convert to protein. It's not as simple as you all think, and yet it's as simple as you all think. So. These are plants that will all use mycorrhiza a whole lot. These ones can take it or leave it, and these ones don't use it at all. So that's why we make a mix. Because the brassicas are not going to support the mycorrhizae, but the rye is. So we're going to mix them together in those mixes so that we support all the services in there and we're not dark one. Now, if I'm having a whole lot of problem with nematodes, I'm doing this. I'm going to get the nematodes, I'm going to put them down, take them down, and then I'm going to go back to solving my problem. And I'm going to have a mix again. But I can use plants to solve my problems. Potatoes are very mycorrhizal. They actually, um, if we didn't do so much digging with them, they are a great soil crop, actually. And that means that we can mitigate some of those effects. We all know about rhizobium. What I want to see, though, are more of these lateral nodules, which is why when we can put the inoculant down below, and if we're in no-till, we don't need to use inoculants every year because they're in there, it means that we get more lateral nodules, which are more effective at fixing nitrogen. I think I've made this point. If we can really get our soils going, we won't leak as much. We'll put more into the screen, and we'll get a better idea. So we're going to manage the soil as a habitat, right? We're going to start doing that. We're going to think about the soil as a habitat. We're going to use plants. Look at the difference in yield and what is the effect of that. That is just by having the mustard. That's a, and, and, and that's what I mean. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we do the right thing and we can change the way things grow. This is about having nitrogen fields. This now is 18 years of continuous wheat, and all those green spots there are where the alfalfa was 18 years ago. Every legume you put in the ground is nitrogen in the bank. And the woodier it is, like alfalfa, the longer it takes to break down, the longer the system holds it, the better off we are. These were my first cover crops experiments. You can see I only had two things, three things, because that's about as complicated as we got at the time. <coughs> we had to grow everything by ourselves because we didn't know what would grow. This is buckwheat, this is Persian clover, woolly pod vetch, which I love, and sub clover. Sub clover, by the way, only grows this high and can live in the bottom of a cornfield forever. Mm. Loves it. Corn loves it. <laughs> Look at all the different roots you get. Facinia. Okay, see all the fine roots here in the fascia? Some people think it's fungi, but it's not. It's actually fine, hairy roots in the fascia. If you have sandy soil, it will aggregate sandy soil like nobody's business. And it's just like the prairie. What we wanted was for every pound or kilo of, of plant material, we had a kilo of nitrogen. So the closer the red was and the blue were overlapping, the more we liked it. So two and nine did that really well, so did five. If we go back, sun hemp, sorghum, sudan, and buckwheat, lentils and phacemia, sub clover, sorghum, sudan, and buckwheat. That darn buckwheat. Doing a great job. And then there was phosphorus. And lentils and buckwheat. This is your rainfall zone in the red. And then this one is oilseed radish and hairy vetch. If we're going to hold things into an organic form, we need to play with plant mixtures a little bit more and understand. And then 
course, we grow wheat, so what happened on the wheat? Number one, which was peas, oats, and veg. Oh my gosh, look at that. 65 bushels to the acre. This was all 15% protein and very high in manganese, phosphorus, zinc, magnesium, and sulfur. Um, we look here, number four. Uh, number five had the highest in iron content. Anything was over 60 bushels, all they, there was no difference between them. Um, six had the highest mineral content in the wheat and worked with the wheat best. Let's go back to six. Fallow beans, peas, and oats. Okay, so you can see that by playing with plant mixtures, we can change things. That instrument is over there. This is my mobile lab. I have $100,000 worth of instruments in the back of my car. Um, and I can do everything. I can tell you the total nutrient content of your plants, tell the total nutrient content of your soils with the XRF, and I can tell you the nitrates and the molecules and the vitamins because I have another instrument in there. It's called an FTIR ATR, which actually tells you all that too. And I do it real time. We have grain. We can do grain analysis. You can point and shoot. I don't usually point and shoot. Um, but, you know, the people, in, when I put that on the airplane, people kind of look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and some people laugh because they just think I'm Star Trek. <laughs> and somebody asked me if I was a Trekkie and if it was real. <laughs> I assured them that I paid $50,000 for a toy. <laughs> Um, you can also tell about varieties. Okay, so this is another Missouri corn growers laughing at me. Um, they laugh because the green is the pioneer and the red is the cow. <laughs> and I said, you know, you can tell that the pioneer is a lot more structurally stronger. And they all started laughing. Um, but you can because here's the silica content and here's the calcium content. So it's a lot of more structural material. And the DeKalb is using a lot more potassium than the Pioneer is, so I have to pay attention to that because it probably likes potassium a lot more. It means I have to watch my potash. But the other thing is, and this is, that is, this is the readout from that instrument over there. The other thing is, is that because it's more structural, when the winds come, it does this. Yeah. And um, so, you know, lots you can learn. Um, Nothing on here, but you can see this is uh, free-range eggs, and the green is the stuff you bought in the store. More calcium, more potassium, and more sulfur, which means more protein. Solvita test. Well, um, I use it this way. I, knew, I now see that Solvita also is showing how to use it this way. Um, this is in the field, doing it at, in real time under your conditions to show you how much nitrogen your soil can actually put out. That's available then. Yeah, it's available nitrogen, mineralized nitrogen. All I want to show you here is there's another way to do this with phospholipid fatty acids. Um, we are not that close, even though Ward Labs is doing this and I help them do that. Um, the interpretation of this is really hard. Um, this is total living biomass here. Um, and living, what's actually living in your sample. But all I want to say is you got to watch the whole movie. This is corn on corn. This is the total living biomass compared to all these other. This is broadcast nitrogen. This is anhydrous nitrogen. This is oilseed rape after clover. This is a cover crop called maize pro. And this is corn after mustard. And this is corn on corn. Now, if you just saw this, corn on corn doesn't look that bad. But you didn't watch the whole movie. You didn't see that corn on corn had almost no living biomass, but the ratio of fungi to bacteria in that living biomass that is there is pretty good. <laughs> it doesn't have any predators either. So it's not cycling anything. After the cover crop is cycling a whole lot, when we actually put when we actually don't put anhydrous in the ground, it works pretty well too. And mustard actually helps as well. Mustard's a good thing, but mustard goes to seed. It's your transition. It's a short-term cover crop. Don't use mustard or buckwheat because they'll go to seed fast unless you're in a six-week window. We want all this to happen. This is everything that goes on in there, and another time we'll talk a whole lot more about that. But we want to see these. Okay, look at that wheat plant. All flowering. Oh, look at that little aphid in there. There's aphids in there. 
think an aphid stands a chance in that wheat field? <laughs> this is why if we can get rid of insecticides, insecticides are really bad for us, but this, what do we spend most of our money on? Insecticides, fungicides, and things like that. I think we have to look for ways to put more money in our pockets and do things environmentally better. And I think this is one of the ways we just need to embrace nature a little bit more and see how we can use her to help us. So 